Chapter 2. The Province of Britain The land on which we live once had the highly poetic privilege of being the end of the world. Its extremity was Ultima Thule, the other end of nowhere. When these islands, lost in a night of northern seas, were lit up at last by the long searchlights of Rome, it was felt that the remotest remnant of things had been touched, and more for pride than possession. The sentiment was not unsuitable, even in geography. About these realms upon the edge of everything, there was really something that can only be called edgy. Britain is not so much an island as an archipelago. It is at least a labyrinth of peninsulas. In few of the kindred countries can one so easily and so strangely find sea in the fields or fields in the sea. The great rivers seem not only to meet in the ocean, but barely to miss each other in the hills. The whole land, though low as a whole, leans towards the west in shouldering mountains and a prehistoric tradition has taught it to look towards the sunset for islands yet dreamier than its own. The islanders are of a kind with their islands, different as are the nations into which they are now divided. The Scots, the English, the Irish, the Welsh of the Western Uplands have something altogether different from the humdrum docility of the inland Germans, or from the bon sang francais which can be at will trenchant or trite. There is something common to all the Britons, which even acts of union have not torn asunder. The nearest name for it is insecurity, something fitting in men walking on cliffs and the verge of things. Adventure, a lonely taste in liberty, a humour without wit, perplex their critics and perplex themselves. Their souls are fretted like their coasts. They have an embarrassment, noted by all foreigners, it is expressed, perhaps, in the Irish by a confusion of speech, and in the English by a confusion of thought. For the Irish bull is a license with the symbol of language, but bull's own bull, the English bull, is a dumb ox of thought, a standing mystification in the mind. There is something double in the thoughts as of the soul mirrored in many waters. Of all peoples they are least attached to the purely classical. The imperial plainness which the French do finely and the Germans coarsely but the Britons hardly at all. They are constantly colonists and emigrants. They have the name of being at home in every country, but they are in exile in their own country. They are torn between love of home and love of something else, of which the sea may be the explanation or may be only the symbol. It is also found in a nameless nursery rhyme, which is the finest line in English literature and the dumb refrain of all English poems, over the hills and far away. The great rationalist hero who first conquered Britain, whether or no he was the detached demigod of Caesar and Cleopatra, was certainly a Latin of the Latins, and described these islands when he found them with all the curt positivism of his pen of steel. But even Julius Caesar's brief account of the Britons leaves on us something of this mystery, which is more than ignorance of fact. They were apparently ruled by that terrible thing, a pagan priesthood. Stones now shapeless yet arranged in symbolic shapes bear witness to the order and labour of those that lifted them. Their worship was probably nature worship, and while such a basis may count for something in the elemental quality that has always soaked the island arts, the collision between it and the tolerant empire suggests the presence of something which generally grows out of nature worship, I mean the unnatural. But upon nearly all the matters of modern controversy, Caesar is silent. He is silent about whether the language was Celtic, and some of the place names have even given rise to a suggestion that, in parts at least, it was already Teutonic. I am not capable of pronouncing upon the truth of such speculations, but I am of pronouncing upon their importance, at least to my own very simple purpose. And indeed, their importance has been very much exaggerated. Caesar professed to give no more than the glimpse of a traveller, but when, some considerable time after, the Romans returned and turned Britain into a Roman province, they continued to display a singular indifference to questions that have excited so many professors. What they cared about was getting and giving in Britain what they had got and given in Gaul. We do not know whether the Britons then, or for that matter the Britons now, were Iberian or Cymric or Teutonic. We do know that in a short time they were Roman, Every now and then there is discovered in modern England some fragment such as a Roman pavement. Such Roman antiquities rather diminish than increase the Roman reality. They make something seem distant which is still very near, and something seem dead that is still alive. It is like writing a man's epitaph on his front door. The epitaph would probably be a compliment, but hardly a personal introduction. 
The important thing about France and England is not that they have Roman remains. They are Roman remains. In truth, they are not so much remains as relics, for they are still working miracles. A row of poplars is a more Roman relic than a row of pillars. Nearly all that we call the works of nature have but grown like fungoids upon this original work of man, and our woods are mosses on the bones of a giant. Under the seed of our harvests and the roots of our trees is a foundation of which the fragments of tile and brick are but emblems, and under the colours of our wildest flowers are the colours of a Roman pavement. Britain was directly Roman for fully four hundred years, longer than she has been Protestant, and very much longer than she has been industrial. What was meant by being Roman, it is necessary in a few lines to say, or no sense can be made of what happened after, especially of what happened immediately after. Being Roman did not mean being subject, in the sense that one savage tribe will enslave another, or in the sense that the cynical politicians of recent times watched with a horrible hopefulness for the evanescence of the Irish. Both conquerors and conquered were heathen, and both had the institutions which seemed to us to give an inhumanity to heathenism, the triumph, the slave market, the lack of all the sensitive nationalism of modern history. But the Roman Empire did not destroy nations. If anything, it created them. Britons were not originally proud of being Britons, but they were proud of being Romans. The Roman steel was at least as much a magnet as a sword. In truth, it was rather a round mirror of steel in which every people came to see itself. For Rome, as Rome, the very smallness of the civic origin was a warrant for the largeness of the civic experiment. Rome itself obviously could not rule the world any more than Rutland. I mean, it could not rule the other races as the Spartans ruled the Helots or the Americans ruled the Negroes. A machine so huge had to be human. It had to have a handle that fitted any man's hand. The Roman Empire necessarily became less Roman as it became more of an empire, until not very long after Rome gave conquerors to Britain, Britain was giving emperors to Rome. Out of Britain, as the Britons boasted, came at length the great Empress Helena, who was the mother of Constantine. And it was Constantine, as all men know, who first nailed up that proclamation which all after generations have in truth been struggling either to protect or to tear down. About that revolution, no man has ever been able to be impartial. The present writer will make no idle pretense of being so. That it was the most revolutionary of all revolutions, since it identified the dead body on a servile gibbet with the fatherhood in the skies, has long been a commonplace without ceasing to be a paradox. But there is another historic element that must also be realized. Without saying anything more of its tremendous essence, it is very necessary to note why even pre-Christian Rome was regarded as something mystical for long afterwards by all European men. The extreme view of it was held perhaps by Dante, but it pervaded medievalism and therefore still haunts modernity. Rome was regarded as man, mighty though fallen, because it was the utmost that man had done. It was divinely necessary that the Roman Empire should succeed, if only that it might fail. Hence the school of Dante implied the paradox that the Roman soldiers killed Christ, not only by right, but even by divine right. That mere law might fail at its highest test, it had to be real law and not mere military lawlessness. Therefore God worked by Pilate as by Peter. Therefore the medieval poet is eager to show that Roman government was simply good government and not a usurpation. For it was the whole point of the Christian revolution to maintain that in this, good government was as bad as bad. Even good government was not good enough to know God among the thieves. This is not only generally important as involving a colossal change in the conscience, the loss of the whole heathen repose in the complete sufficiency of the city or the state. It made a sort of eternal rule enclosing an eternal rebellion. It must be incessantly remembered through the first half of English history, for it is the whole meaning in the quarrel of the priests and kings. The double rule of the civilization and the religion in one sense remained for centuries, and before its first misfortunes came, it must be conceived as substantially the same everywhere. And however it began, it largely ended in equality. Slavery certainly existed, as it had in the most democratic states of ancient times. Harsh officialism certainly existed, as it exists in the most democratic states of modern times. But there was nothing of what we mean in modern times by aristocracy, still less of what we mean by racial domination. Insofar as any change was passing over that society with its two levels of equal citizens and equal slaves, 
It was only the slow growth of the power of the church at the expense of the power of the empire. Now, it is important to grasp that the great exception to equality, the institution of slavery, was slowly modified by both causes. It was weakened both by the weakening of the empire and by the strengthening of the church. Slavery was for the church not a difficulty of doctrine, but a strain on the imagination. Aristotle and the pagan sages who had defined the servile or useful arts had regarded the slave as a tool, an axe to cut wood or whatever wanted cutting. The church did not denounce the cutting, but she felt as if she was cutting glass with a diamond. She was haunted by the memory that the diamond is so much more precious than the glass, so Christianity could not settle down into the pagan simplicity that the man was made for the work, when the work was so much less immortally momentous than the man. At about this stage of a history of England, there is generally told the anecdote of a pun of Gregory the Great, and this is perhaps the true point of it. By the Roman theory, the barbarian bondmen were meant to be useful. The saint's mysticism was moved at finding them ornamental, and non angli said angeli meant more nearly not slaves, but souls. It is to the point in passing to note that in the modern country, most collectively Christian Russia, the serfs were always referred to as souls. The great Pope's phrase, hackneyed as it is, is perhaps the first glimpse of the golden halos in the best Christian art. Thus the Church, with whatever other faults, worked of her own nature towards greater social equality. And it is a historical error to suppose that the Church hierarchy worked with aristocracies or was of a kind with them. It was an inversion of aristocracy, in the ideal of it at least the last were to be first. The Irish bull that one man is as good as another and a great deal better contains a truth like many contradictions, a truth that was the link between Christianity and citizenship. Alone of all superiors, the saint does not depress the human dignity of others. He is not conscious of his superiority to them, but only more conscious of his inferiority than they are. But while a million little priests and monks like mice were already nibbling at the bonds of the ancient servitude, another process was going on, which has here been called the weakening of the empire. It is a process which is to this day very difficult to explain. But it affected all the institutions of all the provinces, especially the institution of slavery. But of all the provinces its effect was heaviest in Britain, which lay on or beyond the borders. The case of Britain, however, cannot possibly be considered alone. The first half of English history has been made quite unmeaning in the schools by the attempt to tell it without reference to that corporate Christendom in which it took part and pride. I fully accept the truth in Mr. Kipling's question of what can they know of England who only England know, and merely differ from the view that they will best broaden their minds by the study of Wagga Wagga and Timbuktu. It is therefore necessary, though very difficult, to frame in few words some idea of what happened to the whole European race. Rome itself, which had made all that strong world, was the weakest thing in it. The centre had been growing fainter and fainter, and now the centre disappeared. Rome had as much freed the world as ruled it, and now she could rule no more. Save for the presence of the Pope and his constantly increasing supernatural prestige, the Eternal City became like one of her own provincial towns. A loose localism was the result, rather than any conscious intellectual mutiny. There was anarchy, but there was no rebellion. For rebellion must have a principle, and therefore, for those who can think, an authority. Gibbon called his great pageant of prose the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The empire did decline, but it did not fall. It remains to this hour. By a process very much more indirect even than that of the church, this decentralization and drift also worked against the slave state of antiquity. The localism did indeed produce that choice of territorial chieftains which came to be called feudalism, and of which we shall speak later. But the direct possession of man by man, the same localism tended to destroy, though this negative influence upon it bears no kind of proportion to the positive influence of the Catholic Church. The later pagan slavery, like our own industrial labour which increasingly resembles it, was worked on a larger and larger scale, and it was at last too large to control. The bondman found the visible lord more distant than the new invisible one. The slave became the serf, that is, he could be shut in but not shut out. When once he belonged to the land, it could not be long before the land belonged to him. 
Even in the old and rather fictitious language of chattel slavery, there is here a difference. It is the difference between a man being a chair and a man being a house. Canute might call for his throne, but if he wanted his throne room, he must go and get it himself. Similarly, he could tell his slave to run, but he could only tell his serf to stay. Thus, the two slow changes of the time both tended to transform the tool into a man. His status began to have roots, and whatever has roots will have rights. What the decline did involve everywhere was decivilization, the loss of letters, of laws, of roads and means of communication, the exaggeration of local color into caprice. But on the edges of the empire, this decivilization became a definite barbarism, owing to the nearness of wild neighbors who were ready to destroy as deftly and blindly as things are destroyed by fire. Save for the lurid and apocalyptic locust flight of the Huns, it is perhaps an exaggeration to talk, even in those darkest ages, of a deluge of the barbarians, at least when we are speaking of the old civilization as a whole. But a deluge of barbarians is not entirely an exaggeration of what happened on some of the borders of the empire, of such edges of the known world as we began by describing in these pages. And on the extreme edge of the world lay Britain. It may be true, though there is little proof of it, that the Roman civilization itself was thinner in Britain than in the other provinces. But it was a very civilized civilization. It gathered round the great cities like York and Chester and London, for the cities are older than the counties, and indeed older even than the countries. These were connected by a skeleton of great roads, which were and are the bones of Britain. But with the weakening of Rome, the bones began to break under barbarian pressure, coming at first from the north, from the Picts who lay beyond Agricola's boundary in what is now the Scotch lowlands. The whole of this bewildering time is full of temporary tribal alliances, generally mercenary, of barbarians paid to come on or barbarians paid to go away. It seems certain that in this welter, Roman Britain bought help from ruder races living about that neck of Denmark, where is now the Duchy of Schleswig. Having been chosen only to fight somebody, they naturally fought anybody, and a century of fighting followed, under the trampling of which the Roman pavement was broken into yet smaller pieces. It is perhaps permissible to disagree with the historian Green when he says that no spot should be more sacred to modern Englishmen than the neighbourhood of Ramsgate, where the Schleswig people are supposed to have landed, or when he suggests that their appearance is the real beginning of our island story. It would be rather more true to say that it was nearly, though prematurely, the end of it.